All right, so let's open our Bibles to 1 Corinthians. We're continuing our study. It's a very interesting book, very relevant to our time today, very relevant to the questions we face today as Christians in the crazy modern world. Um, and please, just a little side note, you know, bring your Bibles to church. Bring your Bibles, open your Bibles, and we, we, we will stay in this text for a while. We will look at it. It's a big text. It's the text that Victor read for us earlier, um, and we're going to look at the main ideas in this whole text. But before we dive into that, um, I wanted to ask a question to kind of get us going. What would it take for you today, what would it take for you to be a confident person? Kind of a, a loaded question because maybe I'm assuming that you're not confident and maybe that I'm assuming that you're insecure, but it's still a very valid question. Today, what would it take? What would have to happen in your life? What would it take for you to be confident, to be at peace, to be comfortable in your own skin, right? to be convicted and feeling strong as a person. Some of you may hear that question and think, well, I'm already pretty confident. And that you are, if that is your response. Um, I don't have any major insecurities. I'm a very chill person, and I'm comfortable in my skin, and I don't have anxieties or weirdnesses. And then the question to you is, okay, great, what is your confidence rooted in? Why are you a confident person? Are you confident? And, and, and usually, when we kind of dig around in our heart, honestly, what makes me confident? Well, here's another way to test it. What would, what would have to be taken away today for you to become not confident? So maybe it's your money, or maybe it's your business, or maybe it's your relationships and your people, uh, your family. Maybe it's your social media presence and all the thousands of people that affirm you there. Maybe it's your ministry because you serve God in a certain way and you feel very strong about it, right? When we look at the sources of our confidence, it is very often that we build our confidence on false sources, right? And that's a very important thing to think about. What is, what is your life rooted on, right? Right? Only honest answers here. It's a very important question. And so some of us may hear this question, and we may say something like, man, I don't even know what it would take for me to be confident. I'm exhausted. I'm burned out. I'm anxious. I'm overwhelmed with life. I don't know. I, I don't even know where to begin. I'm, I'm a hopeless mess. In all the different ways that I've tried to gain control of my life and my identity, I keep failing, and I don't know. And actually, I think that answer comes very close to where you need to be to receive the power of God, and that's what we want to talk about today. That is one of the closest answers to the truth of God. As we've mentioned before in this book of 1 Corinthians, these Christians, this church, it's a pretty young church, so Interestingly, right, this church that Paul is writing to is about the same age as our church, something around six years, six to ten years old, less than ten years probably. We're, we've, we've hit six and a half years. This church has been around as a congregation probably about as long as we have. Now, most of us have grown up in the church, so we have a background in, in, in Christian faith. Those people, most of them did not, right? They came, existed as a church, as Living Word Bible Church, but they came from the world. And here, as we're looking at this text today, we are getting into the very meat of what Paul is trying to say. We're starting to get to the essence of his worries, his concern, and his main ideas of what he's trying to communicate to these people. As we've said, he has spent a lot of time with this church. He's, he lived with them for almost two years, teaching them personally. He has a deep relationship with these people, right? It's a very personal situation, and there's a tension between him and this church where these people are starting to question Paul's authority. They're just like, okay, but why Paul? And the reason that they're starting to question Paul's authority is because even though they started out on a very good foundation, as a church, they started, yeah, Jesus gospel, right? The, the, the new church high that many of us have experienced. A few years later, they're starting to settle back into a 
way of thinking that is more to what they used to think. They're starting to allow the ideas, philosophies, and value systems of the world to seep back in. We think oftentimes that we, when we change, it's like, oh yeah, I committed my life to Jesus, I uh, you know, did this Bible study, I read these books, I'm good. But when we realize that change, true spiritual maturity and change, it's a slow process, right? And we think, oh, here we are, we're good, Living Word Bible Church, we're solid. Five years later, some problems seeping back in, right? Worldliness, old ways of thinking and valuing, right? That's what's happening in the Corinthian church. And, and Corinth as a city was a booming city. We know that. It was like we said last time, it was kind of a combination of New York, Las Vegas, and Los Angeles. It was, there was a lot of money in this city. It was very prosperous commercially. There was a lot of culture because of the money. There was a lot of wisdom. There was a lot of teachers coming to this city gathering students, gathering schools. There was a lot of religion, pagan idolatry. There was a lot of fancy temples and idolatrous practices in the city. It was a booming city, and it was a party city. And if you came out of that life into the Christian life, there's a lot to disentangle from. Even if we, as Christians today, we're raised in the church, we live in the world, right? We realize we have a tension between even us maintaining correct boundaries between our value system, and the world value system. And how do we prevent false ideas from seeping into our life and infecting us? That is really at the heart of what Paul is trying to get into here. And there's two core value systems that Paul is confronting here, or two values, sort of, that are the pillars of the Greek and Roman world. And really, these values, as we look at this text, it's not just the Greek and Roman world, it's, it's the world. These two values are wisdom and power. Wisdom and power. And it comes in various forms, right? Power in terms of political power, power in terms of money, power in terms of business, influence power in terms of cultural power. For example, influence, influencers in our time on social media, people who have power, people who say things, thousands of people listen to them, right? And wisdom. Wisdom meaning being a person who can figure things out, see the answers that other people don't. Order your life, structure your life in a way that is successful. Uh, structure your life in a way that makes you receive more uh, profit or rest or pleasure, right? So money, uh, wisdom, and power are the two kind of pillars that Paul, and when we look at this whole text, even though it's a longer text, it's a pretty simple argument. He's going to war with the, with the worldly idea of wisdom and power. And so he wants, he wants the Corinthians to get a clear outline of how do, how do we view ourselves in relationship to the world, right? Because in the Corinthian church, the world is leaking into the church. And so how does he do that? The first point that we need to make as we look at this text is that he wants to show us this idea that God is out to destroy the wisdom and power of the world. God is on a mission. God is doing something in this world. And what is he doing in this world? Look at verse 18 and 19. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but it is the power of God to us who are being saved. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will set aside the intelligence of the intelligent. And then he continues in verse 20. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the debater of this age? Hasn't God, hasn't God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Hasn't God brought it to nothing? So the first idea that Paul wants us to see, it's a very simple idea. When you look at the world around you and you look at the system of values, the things we cherish, the things that we are impressed by, the things that we think are very worth our time and energy, the things that we think are most interesting, right? Paul says, when you look at the world and the things that make this world strong, wisdom and power, Paul says, when you look at God's perspective, God is on a mission in this broken world. God is on a mission to destroy human wisdom and power. God is working in this dark world to crush the glory of the world. 
From the very outset, he wants them to see that the things that the world is most proud of, those are the things that God, sovereign God who is creator of all things, that God, he is most opposed to those things. God hates the power and wisdom of the world, the value systems of the world, right? And so, like we said, what are those things? What are the values here? In verse 22, he says this phrase. He says, you know, we come to this world, and what do we face? Well, the Jews, they ask for signs. They want miracles, verse 22. And the Greeks, they want wisdom. And so, when, he's, when he speaks of Jews and signs, he's, he's referring to this hunger for power because the Jewish people, they had a very specific expectation of God. They said, okay, God's going to come save us. How is he going to save us? He's going to do it like this. We know, just like in the Exodus, God came with blasting power and made all of Egypt fall apart, supernaturally destroyed Egypt. That's how God's going to show up. The Messiah is going to show up on a horse with an army. He's going to crush the Romans. And we, the Jews, we will triumph. We will be powerful over all the world. That's what we expect from God. That's the kind of gospel they want to hear. And by saying that of the Jews... Later, we see that he's not just talking about Jewish people. He's also talking about this general trend in the, human, in the human heart. We lean on, we rest in visible display of strength and power. Let me see what he can do, right? Let me see what this person, how can this person back up their words? What is their financial history? How many, how many followers do they have? Or how, what experience do you have in this area? How can you show me that you can really do what you say you can do? And, and Paul is saying, guys, look, God's mission, when God looks at the world, there's a lot of beautiful things in the world. Men are wise and, and, and able because men are crafted in God's image, right? And that's all good. But men use the gifts God gives them to exalt their own power and wisdom. That is what people are all about. That is what this world is all about. And God says, I hate that, and my mission is to destroy that. That is what I'm doing in this world. Why is that? Because the human expression, the human hunger for wisdom and power is just the result of that ancient lie from the garden. You shall be as gods, right? That is the result of sin. That's the very heart of sin. What is sin? Sin is not, sin is not just disobedience to certain commandments, right? Sin at its essence is I want to live as though I am my own God. And we do that through two main avenues, wisdom and power. Wisdom is what I can think of myself, what I can figure out about life on my own. Power is what I can accomplish with my own hands, right? Those are the two things that we as human, fallen human beings, those are the two things, what I can discover and realize with my own thinking and what I can accomplish with my two hands, those are the two things that for us, it is most easy to trust, right? When we see money in the bank account, we have peace. When we have a lot of people around us who say how good we are, we have peace. When we think about life and we figure out solutions that other people don't figure out, or we structure our life, our family life, when we read a lot of books and we figure out things that other people don't figure out and our life is functioning smoothly, we have rest because we feel like we're in control. And Paul says... Throughout history, as God is revealing a plan of salvation, God is also, at the same time as he's revealing salvation, he is revealing judgment on human hearts that trust themselves. You shall be as gods. This is the virus, speaking of viruses, right? This is the virus that never stops mutating and always, starts, always re-enters the human heart. Even if you've been a Christian all your life, This is the virus that re-enters the human heart. How can I trust my own thinking and my own actions over God, right? So Paul's core argument at the very center is this. Paul's saying, guys, when you are allowing the world to influence you, when you look at the wise people in the world and you listen to them and they're just so smart and there's so many people around them, or you look at the powerful people and all that they built in their businesses and their money, right? And you look at these people and you're so impressed. You're like, wow, that is so cool, Paul says, wait, stop. Don't you realize you are admiring the thing that, is God, that God is coming to judge and destroy? 
As a Christian, do you have clear understanding of how you view the world? Do you realize that when you see the world, you see both tragedy and beauty? You see the beauty because human beings can do great things, because human beings are created in the image of God. We can accomplish great things, but we accomplish those great things. We build great cities and lives and families, and all that we do, we do it for our own glory. And that's the tragedy. Paul says, do you realize that the things that the world holds dear are the things which God hates most. And God is here to destroy it. So how is God destroying this power and wisdom? Well, Paul says that the simplicity of the gospel, the simplicity of God's message of salvation, it defies all human wisdom and power. There's this funny video on the internet from a few years ago. I didn't find it this week. I didn't have time to look it up. But it's, it's, it's this video where this, uh, this professional basketball player um, gets professional makeup done and dresses up as a like, bent-over old man. He's got this beard and mustache and wrinkles. I mean, he really looks just like this old guy with a cane, and he's just hobbling along. So they dress this guy up like an old man, looks exactly like an old man. He comes to this basketball court in the city where a bunch of young men are playing basketball. And he's just like, oh, guys, can I try and play with you? And they're just like, kind of like, okay, awkward, you know, like, sure, old man, you can play with us. And they're just like, you know, okay, here, pass him the ball. And he's just like, oh, you know, like, and it's kind of like an awkward situation, but kind of funny. And then all of a sudden, he just like whips out all these moves and like owns them and like dunks the ball. And they're just like, what is going on? Like, at first, they're very confused. And then, like, later on, he's just, like, playing, like, completely playing circles around everybody. And they're like, okay, this, something's weird here. And then he's like, oh, yeah, well, I'm not an old man. It's a funny situation because that initial shock of expectation versus outcome, right? In a sense, when Paul is talking about God's plan to destroy the wisdom of the world, Paul is kind of saying, this is what God did. God came into this world to reveal his infinite power and wisdom. But he did it in a way that nobody saw, nobody detected. God sent a message into this world. God sent a savior into this world. God sent a movement of his spirit and salvation into the world. And he did it in such a way that it flew under all the radars of all the wise and powerful and rich and super elite people of the world. Look at verse 20 and 21. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the debater of this age? Hasn't God made the world's wisdom foolish? How? For since in God's wisdom, the world did not know God through wisdom, it was, it was God's pleasure to save those who believe through the foolishness of what is preached. To save those who believe through the foolishness of what is preached. When he says foolishness, he says the gospel is foolishness. He's not talking about that we believe dumb things, right? But in light of the world and its ideas and its value systems, this simple message of a Savior who came, a Savior who is God and man who came into the world, this is foolishness. And yet through this simple message, God is saving humanity. God is supernaturally transforming people. And so in this way, God, through the simplicity of the gospel, is defying the power and the wisdom of the world. Throughout history, you, you see this when you read Western history, and right, you see thinkers, right? You see these philosophers and religious uh, wise sages who have all these ideas, these insights, and people cling to their words, people gather around them, people quote them, and they're just like, wow, so wise, so amazing, right? And then you have these super powerful, you have Nebuchadnezzar, and you have the, the Caesars, you have, you have these super powerful people who, ex who controlled, you know, who, who wielded power over the whole world, millions of people at their disposal, right? And at and everybody, if you look, what are they all doing? Everybody is trying to figure out the key to life. Some people are saying the key to life, oh, just my power. I control the whole world. You know, Hitler wanted to exterminate all the impure people and purify the world. That was his philosophy, his idea, right? The philosophers, they have their ideas. This is the key. The key is this. 
The key is this. Everybody has their key that they're holding up and saying, here it is. Everyone is trying to attain salvation. Everyone is trying to attain some kind of salvation, right? And, you know, we're not philosophers and we're not super billionaire, uh, you know, world leaders in here. But every single one of us is doing the same thing. We are all attaining to some key. We're all, if only I get this, if only I get stability in my family, if only all my kids will be Christian and good, then I will be successful. Or if only I get my career, or if only I get that husband and wife, then I will be successful. All of us, we strive after these keys, the thing that we think will be that which gives us power, which gives us wisdom, which gives us rest, right? Right? God brings into the world this message, Paul says, and this message, you don't have to be a super bazillionaire, you don't have to be a super wise sage or a priest, right? This message, it is brought to the streets of Jerusalem, and from the streets of Jerusalem, it floods out into the streets of the Roman cities and Rome and Ephesus and Corinth. People with no knowledge of God, people with no experience, they hear this message, they receive this Savior, and they are supernaturally transformed. They are made new. That is the greatest plot twist of all history, right? This message that says, we are all broken, you can't bring anything to the table, you're so sinful, but God has made a way, right? Right? The wisdom and power of the world does not help. And actually, here's the big, here's the big juke, right? Here's the big twist. The higher you are on the ladder in the world of being rich and powerful and wise, the more difficult it is for you to actually receive the gospel. Because the higher you climb of you thinking you can attain God and knowledge and success and power in life, the higher you climb that ladder, the further you are from being able to receive the true gospel, the true simplicity of what God has done. It's always interesting to listen. I'm, I'm always interested to listen to smart people because, you know, they're smart. And God, it's, it's kind of like the glory of God shines in the human mind. The glory of God shines in human accomplishment in a way. It's, we're imaging God even though we're using what he gave us for bad ends, And you can see how people think and they come up with ideas and they evaluate life and they see stuff that nobody else sees and you're like, wow, in a way it's so amazing. But then when you listen to people and you get to the very heart, like what do they they believe is the very point of life? And it's amazing because they can talk about so much wisdom about all these other secondary things, but when it comes to the very center, eternity, your soul, life and death, they don't have answers. You know, you have people like, you know, Elon Musk, who's like on the edges, he's private, you know, created his own systems of traveling to space. He has all these, but like at the end of the day, what's he think the human brain is? He thinks it's just some computer, like you can download it, and he wants to create a program so that he will be a human in the computer sphere, not in the human brain. Like, he just thinks that you're just a machine. Like, he, like at the end of the day, he doesn't realize There is a soul. There is eternity. Dude, you're smart, but you just totally missed the most important thing, the most basic thing. Paul says in verse 26, he says, guys, look at your church. And this applies to us. We're simple folk here in Ferndale, right? Verse 26, brothers and sisters, consider your calling. Not many of you were wise from a human perspective. Not many of you powerful. Not many from a noble birth. Instead, God has chosen what is foolish in the world. No, no, uh, no offense, right? God has chosen what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen what is weak in the world to shame the strong. So he's taking us simple people Right, And he says, you simple people, you are living proof that the gospel, the power of God, you don't need to be going to secret depths, right? The power of God has come to you through God's mercy, through God's wisdom. The church is not a place of the elite, right? 
And, and most of history, the elite rulers of the world, they were not Christians. And the ones who were Christians weren't very good Christians, a lot of, most of them, right? The ones who used Christianity in their, in their polit- political power usually became totally corrupt and broken in their use of the faith. The elite of the world mostly are not believers in Jesus. That does not mean that everybody in the church is a dummy. That does not mean that smart people don't get saved. There is hope for some of us. Now, the, point, the point he's making is just this general trend. He says, look at history. Look what, a, look what God has done. The great reversal, right? God has brought his message to the simple people, this message of salvation. And, and we may think, okay, well, then we're the smart ones, right? So like, ha ha, sucks to, like we figured it out. We received Jesus. You didn't. You were so smart up there, but you missed the answer and we got it. Ha, no. Why did we receive it? Notice what Paul says. He says, God was chosen what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God has chosen what is insignificant and despised in the world, what is viewed as nothing, to bring to nothing what is viewed as something. 29, so that no one may boast. No, no, we simple folks, we believe in Jesus. Why? Because God has sovereignly chosen to work in our hearts. You're not better than anybody. You're not better than the smart people or the dumb people. You're here because of God's mercy. The church is not composed of people who thought it up, who figured it out, who got it all right. We're not, we're not you know, as we like to put ourselves, nice, neat, and tidy Christians. No, we're all, we're all fools. And we are those who, to whom God has poured mercy so that no one may boast. That does not mean, of course, that the, the Christianity is anti-intellectual, that Christianity doesn't make people think that we don't believe in thinking and being smart and wisdom, because actually the whole point that we're getting to and we're talking about next week as well, no, 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 it is through the simplicity of the gospel that the wisdom of God is revealed. We have in our hands the eternal wisdom of God. There is depths of riches, but we got this not through our own self-reliance. God is not anti-intellectual. God is not anti-money or power, right? Money and power, they all belong to God. God is the most rich and powerful one of all. God is not against those things. What God is against is he's anti-self-reliance. And it just so happens that wisdom and power are the ways that we rely on ourselves. But this idea is the center of everything. God is against self reliance. To accept the message of Jesus, when we have to remember this as Christians, right? Let's think about this. To accept the message of Jesus is to go against the grain of your own pride and your accomplishment. You can't sell Jesus by saying, this is the most smart and amazing thing. If you get Jesus, your life will be so perfect and figured out and everything, right? The people who try to market Jesus as a, in a tool, uh, in the methods of the world, they don't have the right Jesus. The real Jesus, if you accept the message of Jesus, you're accepting a story that is clearly against all of your pride and all of your self-reliance. It crushes your pride. It crushes your sense of wisdom. It crushes your sense of ability to accomplish something, right? To receive Jesus, and, and we want to be clear on this. What does it mean to receive the gospel? It's to admit that you are a sinner, that you are broken, that you are lost, right? To accept Jesus is to trust, to turn from your sin, and to trust in God and what he did, not what you can do. It is to believe that he is the one who died in your place. He paid for your sins with his blood. He bought you to make you his child. You were you a rebel, and he has taken you off the streets. He has clothed you in his, his perfect garments. He has made you his child. That is what it means to receive Jesus, right? And that you're trusting in this king who is coming back. He's coming back to judge all. This Jesus is your king. When you receive Jesus, you're not receiving a self-help genie. When, when you receive Jesus, you are a, you're bowing to a Lord. You are bowing to a master. This master is good. 
He loves you, but he is your master, right? There's nothing in the gospel that appeals to the wisdom and power of the world. There's nothing in the gospel that appeals to our sin, sin-ridden hearts. And that's why this is the virus that keeps mutating and keeps coming back into our hearts even after we receive Jesus. We still want to go back to self-reliance. So the confident person, the person who's confident and strong, is usually the person who is infinitely further from God than the person who is broken, weak, and desperate because it is to those kind that God comes, right? And, and what does he give? Like, what, what kind of gospel is this, right? That's our third point. Jesus is the doorway to wisdom and power. So God is not just here to destroy the wisdom and power of the world, right? God is destroying the wisdom and power of the world. How? Jesus, the simple gospel, the simple Savior, this Jesus, he is the doorway to the infinite wisdom and power of God in your life. What do you get when you get Jesus? It's a question that we as Christians should ask more often. We should, we should, we should reflect on this question more. What, what do I get when I get Jesus? Yeah, I'm a Christian. What does that mean? What, what did I get? What did I sign up for? What did I purchase? Verses 30 and 31. It is from him, from God, that you are in Christ Jesus, who became Wisdom from God for us, our righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, in order that it is, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Or verse 22, 23, and 24, the Jews seek for signs and the Greeks seek for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, the stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles, yet to those who are called, both to the Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. What, is, what do we get when we get Jesus? When we come to the table today, when we celebrate that we receive Jesus, body and blood, bread and wine, right? We, this, it's a powerful physical sign. It's a powerful practice. We eat. Jesus says, eat my flesh and drink my blood. He's not saying that literally. He's saying, receive me. What do you get when you get Jesus? You get the power of God and the wisdom of God. In Jesus, Paul says in Colossians chapter 2, right? Who is Jesus? In Jesus, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are present. In Jesus, all All the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Notice how Paul says very similar thing in Colossians. He says, guys, be careful that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit and human tradition based on the elements of the world and not on Christ. For, think about this, verse 9. Look at verse 9. For the entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ. That's a mouthful. Verse 9, the entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ. And you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. Like you can sit and meditate on those two verses for a week. Think about it. What do you get when you get Jesus? The creator God, the maker of the universe, the one who who made you, the one who crafted, created you, the Lord and Savior of the whole world, he dwells inside of you. He fits his full glory, his full presence, his full nature. He fits himself inside your heart. And he comes into your life to lead, to guide, to love, to unleash on you his power, to transform you, to give you victory over sin, to give you joy. What do we get when we get Jesus? If that doesn't blow our mind, nothing will, right? Simple gospel, mighty God. Through the simple Savior Jesus, 
God himself comes to dwell with us. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, because of our because of his death for us, we are given this gift of God. And, and, and think about it. The, our Christian life, it's a simple thing in a sense, right? We're disciples. You know, every day we get up, we're trying to learn to follow Jesus. We're reading his word, we're praying, we're trying to live in community. We're learning these rhythms, right? This simplicity of daily discipleship. But it's not just you doing your thing, right? The simplicity of our daily discipleship, the God of the universe shows up every day to help you, guide you, empower you, teach you, counsel you, and fill you with his wisdom and his power. That's crazy, right? Paul says, God, through this foolish little gospel. God gives us Jesus, and in Jesus, the unleashing of his power and wisdom in our hearts, in our lives. And Paul says, guys, when you have this Savior, why are you so impressed by the world? Why are you so impressed by the billionaires and the wise sages and the teachers? And why do you think that they're so much cooler than the gospel? Because that's what happens. We still get bored. We still get sidetracked. We still get distracted. We still get enticed by the voices of the world. So Paul says, so when I came to you to announce the mystery of God, I did not come to you with brilliant speech and wisdom. I, didn't, I wasn't trying to impress you guys. I decided this. I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and trembling. My speech was preached not in mere with persuasive words of wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit's power. So our, the question for us as we're reflecting on this, as we're preparing our hearts for this table today, right? Do I walk in the power of God? I've received Jesus. I'm a Christian. I've been following Jesus. But... But am I constantly getting sidetracked and distracted and and enticed and impressed by so many things, but Jesus to me just isn't impressive, right? Or are you walking in the power of God? Paul says this, Paul says, I came to you guys, I came to you not to impress, but I came to you in power. And guess what? All of you guys got saved, and you, you're now completely new creatures in Christ. That's power. The power of God is not demonstrated through our human ordinary means, right? The power of God is demonstrated in the transformation of our daily lives. He gives us power to put sin to death. He gives us knowledge and wisdom of how to prioritize our lives, to love him, to love each other. Do you walk in the power of God today? Or do you walk in the power of the world you walk in the power of your own wisdom and your abilities. So a couple, of, a couple of practical ways to analyze ourselves, right? There's a few areas or spheres of power. Your everyday life and your relationships. Look at just the mundane, right? Some of, a bunch of us are young families. Look at your family life. If you truly believe Jesus is the source of power and wisdom, then it follows that conversations about Jesus, conversations about spiritual growth, conversations about the Bible, these things will be normal and inseparable from your life. Right? Notice here that the point is not guilt. The point is not, guys, you need to be more spiritual, so talk about the Bible more. Prove yourselves. No, no, no. This is for the weak. If you, if you really view Jesus as the true power, then you're just going to be all about that. You're just going to be thinking about it. You're going to be learning about it. You're going to be trying to get that power in your heart more and more, right? You're going to come to this Savior. We can be, I think it's crazy, like here's a side thing that's crazy that we can be Christians all of our lives, right? But when it comes to your family life, this is talking about families, it's talking about fathers specifically, men, we can find it awkward and uncomfortable to talk about Jesus with our families. Why? Or we are awkward and uncomfortable to talk about Jesus in our daily lives. Why? If I'm awkward and uncomfortable, again, the point here is not be like, get over it, be tough. No, no, no. 
The point is, wait, but if I'm awkward about Jesus, doesn't that actually show that I think Jesus is embarrassing? Doesn't it betray the fact that I have not fully grasped Jesus is my power? Jesus is my wisdom. Jesus is my everything. If, if, you, if you're grasping this truth, it's going to start changing the way you feel about it, the way you talk about it. It's going to be your breath. It's going to be your everyday life. Yeah, Jesus is my power. That's what I talk about. That's what I think about. That's why I live. It's no big deal. It's not like I'm more spiritual than other people because I talk about Jesus. No, I'm weak. That's why I talk about Jesus. Or friendships. No, youth life is friendships. It's all about friendships, hanging out, doing fun stuff. Having fun is great, right? It's not like we should be having Bible studies 24-7. But the point is this. What is the glue to your friendships? When, you have, when you're with your friends, when you're hanging out, what, what holds you together? If there is no Christ and if there is no truth, the point is not you guys are not being good Christians or you're not spiritual enough. No, the point is, do you believe Jesus is the true power? If you do, it's just going to be the thing that binds you with people. It's going to be the thing you're going to be hungry for. You're going to be thirsty for that, for that living water. It's going to naturally come out. And sometimes we have to break our old habits by thinking, man, why, why do I behave this way? I don't even believe it. I believe Jesus is the true power. I'm going to talk about it. Even if I feel awkward at first, I need to learn because I need him every day. Or another area, your values, your, your deepest joys and your aspirations. What do you dream about? What do you daydream about? Right? What, what do you aspire to? Or here's another question. What are you impressed by? Whoa, that's impressive. What is, what is impressive to you? On a level, we can evaluate the world and we can say, wow, the music, the culture, the art, the money. You know, when we look at the world, in a way, we can say, wow, that's impressive. It's beautiful. Human beings create beautiful things. It's, it's powerful. But on a deeper level, we should be like, oh, but man, those lost souls, they think they, they, think they have everything but they don't have the living water. When Jesus is my only power and wisdom, then my aspirations begin to align with his kingdom. Where is your life going? What's your five-year plan, right? You think about your future. We, we, you may not have a five-year plan, but we all have a future in our brains. You don't, you don't think about it. You do it all, all of a sudden. And your future, you construct your future dreams automatically without even thinking about it based on what you believe is truly powerful, and wise. Your wisdom, your sense of wisdom and power, it leads you to construct your future vision, right? When Jesus is the true power, then you have a very different view of your future. You want to align everything you do with his kingdom. Jesus is the king. He's doing something in this world. Through the church, Jesus is transforming a broken world. What does that mean? It means that my life is going to be, my my priorities are going to be different. The church, these people, this is my people. Whatever the church is doing, this is what I'm doing. I'm, gonna, I'm dedicated to these people because together we are here to do the work of Christ. Right? So church ministry, membership, church attendance, that's why we take these things very seriously. Attending small groups. Why do we, it's not because we try to be all holy. No, it's because we take the kingdom of God seriously because Jesus is the power. Relationships in the church, Right? You don't want to have, if, you, if Jesus is your power, then you, want to, you crave depth. You don't just want to have these shallow relationships. You get together, you taste, say some dumb jokes, watch TV, and then leave. And like, there's, no, there's no depth, right? You're going to crave depth. You're going to look at everything in your life. You're going to talk about, oh, that's is that next point. No. You're, going to, you're going to think differently about ministry. You're going to think differently about your talents. You're going to think differently about your family life, right? You're going to look at everything. You're going to be like, okay, Jesus is the king. He is my power. He is my wisdom. I, I don't want to waste anything. I'm going, to, I'm going to actively be realigning my life. This doesn't happen automatically, right? You should, we should see that the, the, the virus of self-reliance is always building our kingdoms based on our desires. And growing in Christ's power is bringing everything under his submission, bringing every part of my life and saying, okay, how do we live under the king here and here and here and here? How do we celebrate his wisdom and power here and here and here? You're excited to do that. You're not doing it because, oh, I got to be a better Christian. So I got to read my Bible with my family or I got to talk about Jesus or I got to like give away some of my money. Ugh. No, it's our joy when we see who he really is, right? 
Or another one, your spiritual performance. Think about this. When, when, when most of us, right, we, we read our Bibles and we do the whole spiritual thing and we think it's kind of like a scorecard, you know? You did really good this week, you feel good about yourself. You didn't do so good, you feel bad about yourself. And here's the key. When you feel weak spiritually, based on your human mindset, when I feel weak, I feel distant from God. Because I have not done good, right? But when I see Jesus is my power, when I feel weak, that's, what, that's my cue to run to Jesus. My weakness is not a barrier. My weakness is the thing that reminds me to come to Jesus, right? If you're living on spiritual performance, you're always going to be discouraged. You're always trying to prove yourself. But if you're living on Christ as the power, you're broken in your sin, but then you're confident. You're strong because your Savior lives. Yes, I failed today, but I repented. I came to him. I came to his word. And today I can stand strong because my Savior lives. Right? So Jesus changes how I view that. Or finally, kind of interconnected to that, your, your relationship to sin. How do you battle sin? From a human perspective, if you believe sin is actually really appealing, you know, why do we get stuck in deep sins that don't let go? It's not just habit. There's something deeper there. When a sin won't let go, when you're gripped by some sin that you can't break out of it. Why? Deep down, there are deeper assumptions. You have certain needs, you have certain pains, you have certain desires, and you believe, you have come to this belief that this sin, it will satisfy, it will deliver on its promises, right? But when Paul exposes the world and he shows us Christ is the power, we start to see that sin is always like salt water. It's, it's a lie. It's always a lie. And we start to see Jesus is not just a pill we take. He's not just something good for us. Jesus is the thing we crave. When you grow in this sense, Jesus is what I crave because he's really wise and powerful. Like this is where I get my power when you really believe that, your craving for Jesus grows and your disgust for sin grows and your power to kill sin grows because he gives you that power, right? So Paul says that the power and the wisdom of God is unleashed upon us in the simple gospel, right? And it is our call to see that, to see the world correctly, to see ourselves correctly, and to see what an amazing thing we have. As we're finishing up here, I just want to read these two verses from this hymn. Um, I forgot the name of the hymn, but it'll come to me as I read it. He's describing this, this state of our soul, right, and the power of Christ. Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night, your eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke. The dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. This hymn is called, And Can It Be? No condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him, my living head, and clothed in righteousness divine. Bold I approach the eternal throne, and claim the crown through Christ my own. Bold I approach the eternal throne, and claim the crown through Christ my own. Paul says, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus and him crucified. Is that our power today? And as we're coming to the table today, that's what we want to reflect on. We come here, we, feel, we should feel weak, we should feel trembling. Because we, who are we to partake of this? We are nobody but our Savior lives, and that is our strength, and that is our power. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that there is nothing we could bring to the table today. We, there's nothing, this is, this is not a potluck. 
your feast that you set the table before us, we come as beggars, we come empty-handed. Lord, and we thank you that in your grace, you have not just brought the salvation to us, but you have also turned on the light in our hearts. You have shown us that our own foolish ideas of wisdom and power, those, those ideas are foolish, they're empty, they're mirages, they're fake. Lord, we, we sense in our hearts this, this virus that always attacks us. We, we, we are so tempted to be enticed by the power of the world. The people around us at work, their strength, their confidence maybe, the ideas of the world, they seem so appealing. Lord, and we forget the amazing treasure we have, the feast we have in Christ. Lord, we thank you for the simple gospel. We, we thank you for the simplicity of our daily discipleship that we can come to the table every day and this wondrous thing takes place. You show up in your grace, in your glory, in your goodness, in your power, in your wisdom. You are here today to love us, to care for us, to nurture us, to make us your own people. Lord, we, we are broken by this truth. We thank you, Lord. Lord, help us to receive you as the Savior who is strong, who is kind. Help us to, help us to truly run to you in simplicity. Lord, teach us our hearts to, to, to be running to you, to, to be turning to you to be realigning our value systems today. Lord, help us to be convicted. Help us to think about our lives. What are we doing with our lives? Help us, Lord, to, to desire nothing else except you, your message, your kingdom, through our businesses, through our families, through our educations, through the diapers we change or the coffee we make this week, the friendships, the conversations, the houses we build. Through all these things, Lord, help us to be thirsty and hungry for you to channel your power through us everywhere so that we could be living examples of the power of the cry of the cross. We thank you for the simple Savior who comes to us, Lord, and we ask you that you teach us to run to you, to rest in you. Amen. Amen.